So please now turn to the Word of God and Luke chapter 3. Uh, we will be going through this passage, uh, most of this passage, or the middle part of this passage, verse by verse, so it would be good to have a Bible open. If you're using an electronic device, I suggest you turn off notifications so that you can actually not get distracted by things coming in during the time. So Luke chapter 3, the page numbers are on the screen if you're using a church Bible. Let's hear God's word. Now in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of, Anani of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. As the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Praise God for his word. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a car and you've heard this sound in an electronic voice, turn around where possible. Before we had Google Maps and Apple Maps, we had things called sat-navs. That you could program where you wanted to go, a bit like the phone now, and it would take you there. But if you got something wrong, you had this voice, turn around. You got that voice because you were going in the wrong direction. And you would end up in the wrong destination unless you turned around. The message of Luke chapter 3, the message of John the Baptist, is turn around. 
Not just where possible, not just if you feel like turning around, but actually you need to turn around, you need to turn your whole life around because you're going in the wrong direction and you're heading for the wrong destination. That word for turn around is the word repentance. You find it in verse 3. He went into all the region around the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. You find it again in verse 8. Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Now last week we looked at the first six verses in some detail. We looked at the, the way of the Lord. We looked at how Jesus has come to rescue a people out of the wilderness of their sin and to keep them in the wilderness of this world. And that, that we need to come on to that way by turning from our sin and turning to him. We're now going to look at that turning in a little bit more detail. John gives the call, come and show your repentance by baptism. Get ready for the one who's going to bring forgiveness. It's urgent. You need to do it. And he, the, the passage starts, verse 7, teaches us the importance of repentance. The importance of repentance. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Now, there are a couple of people who are considering baptism, and we will have a baptism class probably in the autumn, God willing. How do you think they would feel if I started the baptism class? The welcome was, you brood of vipers. It's not really the best way to introduce uh, an invitation to baptism. But it's here in the text of Scripture, and it's there for a reason. We need to ask the question, firstly, who is he addressing? Well, we have a parallel passage in Matthew chapter 3, and in verse 7 we have the same phrase, you brood of vipers. But he's saying that to the Pharisees and Sadducees, to the religious teachers who have, over the years before, been leading people astray. Now, what does Luke say to the crowd? Well, very simply, the crowd heard everything. The crowd heard this, you brood of vipers. But the direction of it was towards the Pharisees and Sadducees. The image of vipers is very powerful. It addresses what the religious teachers were doing in Jesus' day in John the Baptist's day, as John the Baptist prepared for Jesus to come. Vipers poison. And these religious teachers were poisoning. There's a whole section where Jesus challenges them in Luke chapter 11, starting at verse 37. I'm not going to read the whole passage to you. You can look that up when you get home. But in the end of that statement of Jesus in Luke eleven fifty two, he says this woe to you lawyers for you have taken away the key of knowledge you did not enter yourselves and you hindered those who were entering so they were not teaching the truth properly they had the truth but they were not passing it on properly in fact they were hindering people from entering the kingdom of God they were poisoning them. There's something also else in this image. In the days of John the Baptist, people believed that vipers were born, they were born from eggs inside the mother, and the way they were born was by eating their way out of the mother. It's a very graphic and quite nasty image. But it illustrates what these people were doing. They were eating the truth that had been handed down to them. They said in verse 8, we're, we're children of Abraham, we're fine. 
and they'd taken that inheritance that had been passed down to them, and they were living off it. Jesus says that they had the best seats uh, in, in, in the synagogue and at, at the meal places. They were honoured all around. They had fed and got fat and rich from the word of God. And then they were passing on poison. Now I find that as a leader in a local church, hugely challenging. That I feed on the word of God and actually pass on the word of God. And don't pass on poison. I think it's a challenge also to uh, all of us that actually we receive the word of God. We should each day spend time in the word of God. When people see us, they don't see something that poisons them to Jesus, but they see something that draws them to Jesus. But I think it's also a warning to us to be careful who we listen to. Because there are so-called Bible teachers, preachers and so on that fit and get themselves rich, physically rich on the word of God through their so-called teaching ministry and they feed people poison. Let's be on our guard. And let's also pray for our local church leaders that we would stay faithful. You know, a little drop, a tiny speck of ink in a glass of clean water poisons the whole water. It becomes undrinkable. And as we face in our society a growing pressure to conform to the world, it's so tempting for pastors and elders to conform their teaching to make it a bit more comfortable. But what we do when we do that is we serve up poison. There's only the life-giving truth of the Word of God, the unadulterated, pure Word of God that changes lives and builds his church. And if we are getting this wrong, we need to repent. The call to repentance is important because what we pass on to people is important. It's vital. This means that repentance includes a recognition of truth. He was calling these people to recognize that they were in the wrong, that actually they were not teaching truth. And indeed, repentance starts with actually us saying, I'm wrong. I'm going in the wrong direction. I remember more than once shouting at turn around where possible because I was getting so frustrated and I was lost. I was saying, shut up. But actually, I needed to stop saying shut up and recognize the truth that my car was going in the wrong direction and turn around. And so repentance starts with a recognition of truth that I'm going in the wrong direction. When we come to the word of God each day, there is that truth that comes that says, what are you doing? Where are you going? That as I read today, in, I read today in, in Psalm 21, and it speaks of the victory of Jesus Christ. And I'm really challenged about how often I focus on my problems rather than the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's just a little small example. You've probably got many examples yourself. But just to share how it happened. God, God speaks through our, his word and we recognize the truth and it's time to change. That's why we need to be in the word of God each day. So it's important. And it starts with the truth. And it's also important because without repentance, we end up where we don't want to be. John says, verse 7, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, when I or you get angry, it is often just an outburst. Because we're frustrated by something. But God's wrath is not an outburst. God's wrath is his just and righteous response to sin. And so, 
Because he is perfect and holy, he will judge sin. And if we don't want to end up with our sin being judged, we need to turn around. Now, if you're a Christian, you already have, I pray, turned around, but we need to stop going back and living like we live like the world. We have escaped the wrath to come if you've put your trust in Christ, repented of your sin. But let's not live like the world around. Repentance is important. That's the first thing. The second thing is, who needs to repent? It says in verse 8, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. We'll come back to that. The rest of verse 8, do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. John the Baptist challenges the religious people who were trusting their religion and their ethnic background. They were physical children of Abraham and they were good, upstanding Jews. And John challenges them and says, look, you say I'm this, but actually God can save anybody. And he used the illustration of stones in the wilderness. Now, I, I went uh, uh, um, 10 plus years ago to Israel, and I went into the wilderness, and there are stones everywhere. What can a stone do? A stone can't do anything. What is a stone worth? A stone is worth nothing. And you know, when it comes to being saved, we can do nothing. Even to repent and believe, we need his help, as we'll come on to in a minute. We are powerless, and because of our sin, we're worthless. We've broken God's laws. We deserve the wrath of God, not the love of God. And yet, in the love of God, he calls us to turn around from where we're going to face eternal wrath and to turn to the true and living God through his Son. What a privilege. Later on, uh, Peter speaks in 1 Peter chapter 2 of God taking stones and making them living stones and building them up into a spiritual house. Repentance is for everyone. And I know that we can say today, well, my parents were Christian, many of us, and, and brothers and sisters from Africa and the Caribbean, let me speak to you particularly, because you come from a more religious country than we have here in the UK. And it's very easy for, because you have that history in your country, and many people around, the, it, you go to, 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 to towns in the Caribbean and, and cities in Africa, there's churches everywhere. Everyone's a Christian, it seems to be. or well, many people are. And it's easy to take that culture and say, I'm a Christian because it's in my blood. I've come from Jamaica, it's in my blood. I've come from Kenya, I've come from Ghana, it's in my blood. It's not in your blood. Because you need to come to Jesus, yourself. You could have but parents and grandparents who are Christians, but you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And many of us older people born in the UK, we've had parents and grandparents who've followed Jesus. But we have to make that response ourselves. Now there's an interesting pic, uh, illustration or theme that Luke uses here. And if you, if you read through the, the passage, you'll see there is the rep repetition of the wor a word relating to offspring. So in verse 2, John, the son of Zechariah. In verse 7, you brood or offspring of vipers. In verse 8, we have Abraham as our father. And then down in verse 22, 
God said to the Lord Jesus, you are my beloved son. And then we have that whole list of the genealogy of Jesus from verse 23 to verse 38, which ends the son of Adam, the son of God. The question that determines where we are is whose offspring we are. When we're born into the world, we are physical offspring of our parents, but spiritually speaking, we are lost under the wrath of God. We are children of the world. And we need to be turned around to become children of God. You're saved by being born again through repentance and faith. And that change of direction that's seen in the fruit of repentance. Repentance is for everyone. Thirdly, we see the urgency of repentance. In verse 7, John has already mentioned the wrath of God, but in verse 9 it becomes more graphic still. Even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, verse 7 says the wrath is coming. Verse 9 says it's coming soon, or it's ready to come. Now, in one sense, it's, it still hasn't come. There is a day coming when Jesus Christ will return. But for the hearers of John the Baptist, this was fulfilled in part, at least, when Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70. There was a destruction and, Israel, and the people of Israel lost their land. But just because, just because it seems like the judgment of God is delayed, doesn't mean it's not coming. The illustration is the axe is ready, the foot of the tree, to cut the root so the tree falls down. And so John is saying it's urgent. And our response needs to be that we become fruitful. We can only become fruitful if our roots are in Christ. That we have returned from our sin going our own way and come on to the, the way of the Lord, as we looked at last week. And then we are joined to the Lord Jesus Christ. So in verse 9, they use the, 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 the illustration of fruit and a tree being thrown into the fire. And in verse 17, is the illustration of wheat and chaff. So the grain and the husk and the bits that are left over, the grain is fruitful, but the husk goes into the fire. It's a serious warning. And the reason it's important that we reflect on that is repentance leads to fruit. Notice that John says in verse 8, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Now, the word repentance means literally a change of mind. But it doesn't mean a change of mind in that it might say, I got up this morning and I had a full intention of a breakfast of various things, and when I put the toast in the toaster, I changed my mind about what I'm going to have on my toast. It's not that kind of change of mind. It's a complete change of thinking. It's changing from my way, my rules, the world, I'll, I'll do what the world wants because I want to fit in with the world. It's from trusting myself. It's from not believing that God exists. Or if he does exist, I believe he'll, he doesn't, that sin doesn't matter. It's from thinking that I'm a good person. And it's turning around and seeing I'm a sinner. God is holy, God is righteous, God is just, God will punish my sin, I need a saviour. He's seeing Jesus as God the Son, the one who came to die for our sins, and he died in our place, and it's putting all of our trust upon him, and leaning our whole lives upon him, and that results in a change of direction. 
it results in fruitfulness. Because now we have life. Before we didn't have life. Ephesians 2 1 says we were dead in our trespasses and sins. But when you are a believer, you are born again. You are united with the Lord Jesus Christ. You have life. And that leads to fruitfulness. So then, what does repentance look like? Having heard these warnings in verses 7, 8, and 9, it says verse 10, and the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? What then shall we do? Indeed, this same statement was heard from the crowds in Acts chapter 2, at the end of uh, Acts chapter 2, at the end of Peter's sermon, in verses um, 37 and 38. And when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent. Turn around. And, and baptism, while it is a real outward sign, an act of obedience of an inward transformation, the baptism itself doesn't save. Doesn't save. It's an outward sign. We can't even say, oh, I've been baptized. We need to be those who have put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But that salvation is seen in outward fruit. Now I think it's just very important. Just, let's just pause for a moment. Verse 8, John says, Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. The fruits aren't the repentance. The fruits are the result of repentance. And it's quite important because some people think uh, will say th things like, oh, I'm really praying well at the moment, I'm reading my Bible, I'm sharing my faith, and they look at the fruit and they say, oh, I'm, I'm, I must be a Christian. Becoming a Christian is not faith in fruit, it's faith in Christ. There should be fruit. And if there's no fruit, we should be concerned, have we truly trusted Christ? But we must not put our trust in the fruit. We must put our trust in Jesus Christ alone. But having said that, having laid that warning, I don't want anyone to go away from this place thinking the fruit saves me. It doesn't. But the fruit shows that we're saved. John gives instructions. The first instruction in verse 11 is a general one to the whole crowd. He answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. The heart of this is generosity. It's love your neighbor as yourself, Leviticus 19 and verse 18. And being able to do that is a heart that loves God. If we are to be those who are generous and willing to let go of the surplus that we have and to meet the needs of those around us, then our heart has to have been captured by a higher affection, one that loves the Lord more than anything else. So that actually, yes, I can give that away. I can be generous. I don't need to accumulate. And while it's the, the, the focus of this verse is generosity in terms of giving away, because we love God and love our neighbor, and we're not loving the things that we possess, that superior love for the Lord also must surely mean we give up the sins that we love too. And there are things that we do habitually, even as Christians, we kind of love them a little bit too much. When our heart has been captivated by a greater love for the God who saves us, then we'll be 
this giving of our all to him, which then enables us to give ourselves away to others. Fruit of generosity motivated by a superior love for God. That's what flows out of repentance. We see him as the greatest one, as the most wonderful one, as the one who is all-sufficient and all-satisfying, the one whom we can trust our lives to, who has given us salvation. Therefore, we can trust him with everything, including the things that we have. And then we move down to some specifics. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, verse 12, teacher, what shall we do? Verse 13, he said to them, collect no more than you are authorized to do. And the same, similar for soldiers, what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation and be content with your wages. So repentance also includes recognition of sin. What the tax collectors were doing was normal. Tax collectors paid the tax in advance of the Roman Empire and then collected far more than they needed from the people and made a vast profit. That was normal. And often we excuse sin because it's normal in the eyes of the world. So repentance involves looking at the word of God and seeing sin as sin and turning from it. But notice also what repentance isn't. John doesn't say, stop being a tax collector or stop being a soldier. He teaches them to be godly in their circumstances. There are some times when you become a Christian, you think, oh, I'm going to leave my job and do something completely different and go into full-time ministry. But if you've got a call to full-time ministry, that's a great thing. You need to weigh that and test that with, with, with the elders of the church. But actually, the primary calling of a Christian is to be godly in the place God's put to you. And if that's in a shop, or in an office, or in a dust cart, or with, uh, in a school, or in a, a nursery, wherever it may be, be godly in that place. Dale uh, Ralph Davis, who's a great commentator, if you're ever looking for a commentary on a book, find one by him. He's a great commentator and really encouraging as you read him alongside the text of Scripture. Dale Ralph Davis says, Repentance is living ordinary life in a transformed way. Ordinary life, wherever you are, in a transformed way. May God help us to be that. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, but we can take the principles from this list and apply them to our lives. I think there are three things. The general principle is generosity. God provides for our needs, therefore we can trust him and let go of the surplus that we have and give away as he leads. Not everyone is called to give everything away, but we're all called to be generous and not selfish. So the second principle is honesty. The tax collectors were to be honest in the work that they did. And I think the plague on this country is dishonesty from the highest office down. And as believers, we need to be marked by honesty. That we don't lie to people and we don't lie for people. We are honest and clear. And we don't mix truth with lies. And the third principle in these verses is contentment. Notice it says right at the end of verse 14, be content with your wages. My goodness, what a challenge to our society. We all want to have more, don't we? 
But believers are different. We say, Lord, you are sufficient. I have learned the secret in all circumstances to be content. Philippians 4.11 Can we learn a contentment? And that marks us out from the world so that generosity and honesty and contentment are three examples that cause us to stand out from the world. But you know, it's actually quite hard. So finally, as we close, who enables repentance? We'll look at these verses in more detail next time, but in verse 15, the crowd is saying, is John the Messiah? And in verse 16, John answers, I baptize you with water, for he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, if we repent without Christ, this is what will happen. We'll turn around and we'll say, I've got a new resolution, I'll do this. And you try in your own strength, but you end up turning around again. And that's what it's like. How many New Year's resolutions have you not kept? But if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. There's a power within you to put sin to death. A power within you to say yes to generosity and honesty and contentment. A power from him that enables you to be transformed in your workplace, in your families, and in your neighborhoods. And that power comes through putting faith in Christ, repenting of our sin for the first time and putting our faith in Jesus Christ. And when we have done that, we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. We're also adopted. We're no longer a child of the world, but a child of God. So we become those dead stones who are made alive and become part of his kingdom. And he is with us. And the wonderful thing is, not only do we have the power within us, and grace and strength from him to keep on the way, that when we do fall, because we still have a fallen nature until we get to heaven, he picks us up again. We said earlier, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. To forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you've not yet repented, please don't delay. You can't be a Christian without Christ. You can't be a Christian without trusting him, turning to him, which means you've turned away from the past to new life in him. But as Christians, we need to keep turning. When we kind of look over our shoulder, when we stumble and fall, Lord, help us to stay faithful. I'll close with this. There's a verse right at the end of Lamentations. Lamentations 5 and verse 21. It's only half a verse, actually, I want to share with you. But it was pointed out at a conference I was at a few weeks ago. And it says this. It says, Restore us or turn us to yourself, O Lord that we may be turned. And that needs to be a daily prayer for every Christian. Lord, I, even though I'm saved, even though I'm indwelt by the Spirit, I'm a temptation to be pulled back. Lord, turn me to yourself, and I shall be turned. Let's pray. Again, just in the quiet, if there's any areas where you're struggling to turn, let's bring them to him now. If you're not yet a believer, then ask him now to save you. And you have your whole heart turn from living your way to 
to turn turn to Christ in faith and ask him to save you. Father, we say to you, turn us to yourself, O Lord, that we may be turned. Father, you know all of us in this place. You know the whether we know you or not, you know how we're walking on the way. You know the things that we keep stumbling over. You know those areas where we're not being generous and honest and content. Father, you know where we are reading your word and you're speaking to us and we're ignoring it. You know all these things. And yet, Lord, you are full of grace and compassion. Lord, you are slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You say in repentance and, 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 and rest is your salvation. Lord, help each of us where there are areas where we are turning away to turn back to you. That we may reflect Christ in this world. Enjoy the goodness and satisfaction of walking more and more intimately with you, our all-sufficient God, who is more than enough. Lord, let us pursue you more and more out of a love and a joy in your great goodness, because we thank you. You've rescued us from the wrath to come. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.